it is a real pleasure to be here. I've sort of missed the dress code bit because with all the chaos, I was thinking this would be a, a, a few that will just get together with this on scheduled time, so I'll just keep my jumper on rather than putting my shirt and tie. So apologies, Mr. President, I could have my shirt and tie on and looking good for the video. But then this is probably the real me, so uh, rather than the dressed up me. Uh, and it is good uh, to be here. We have until one o'clock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically give an outline of what I would have said last night in hopefully half the time. Uh, rather than what I was going to do yesterday at lunchtime and tonight, uh, because that was the main lecture that I was coming to give, and then be able to take questions from you in, in response to what I've got to say. And the title that I've chosen for the talk last night and to reflect with you today is Dancing at the Crossroads, Transforming Conflict and Building Peace. When we look on our world and listen to our news, it is very clear that we live in a time when the dance of death, rather than the dance of life, is the predominant metaphor of, of what is going on around us. And that dance of death is one that is actually quite complex and because of the times we live in, uh, is become more intimate, more personal to those of us as noble citizens than at any time in history. People were beheaded in the past. People were burnt alive at the stake. And let us not forget, as Miroslav Bof has reminded us in recent weeks, that in England 500 years ago, you could be burned alive at the stake for thinking the wrong thing about what happened at that table. Uh, and that did happen on a number of occasions. Uh, so such violence has always been with us. What hasn't been with us is the capacity for everyone to sit in their own home and in their own sofa and watch it on a YouTube video with the surrounding propaganda. And so we live in a time and place where the terror of this violence is hitting us more and more. It is driven by our technological revolution, which enables this uh, lecture to be recorded and to be overthrown up at me for having said the wrong thing uh, in the future. Uh, but that technological revolution brings us violence by video games, where clean-shaven young Americans and Brits walk into their bases in America and in Wiltshire and direct drones over the northwest frontier province of Pakistan and fire missiles that not only kill baddies, but take out their families at wedding parties as well. The video of YouTube, the social media and its hate, the technology brings the terror very personal into all of our lives and creates this climate of psychological fear, hate and suspicion. Who knows what the drones over Paris the last two nights were about? Somebody making a tourist video. Yet the whole of Paris is in lockdown because the suspicion is these drones that you can buy in your local shop down in the Nile were being used to scout some targets for terrorist attacks. So we're in a heightened state of perpetual fear and of war. And the problem with that, uh, as we're slowly discovering, is that the methods of fighting war slowly become part of our everyday lives. Uh, so the story that's just emerging about Chicago police almost using uh, centers for rendering people out of the way while they sort out who they are and what they're doing and not giving them access, using methods that have been used in Afghanistan and Iraq, coming back into our criminal justice systems. The same in Britain, with the legislation uh, about wanting to stop universities and Christian unions having to, suspecting that they're going to have to have all their speakers submit their addresses before they can be given in the university, in case they're whipping up religious hatred by teaching some Christian truths about other faiths or whatever in the conservative CU movement. So the perpetual war is creating a psychology of fear and suspicion. And it is profoundly personal. Because the violence that we're being reminded of and seen on our television screens is profoundly intimate. Beheading people. Rape as a weapon of war. Not just of women, but of men. Affecting people, their families, dehumanizing them, degrading them, not just defeating them ripping apart their structure, 
making them unacceptable and untouchables in their own culture. And this is a dance of death that we find ourselves in. It is a dance of death that is fueled by a question. How do we live with our deepest differences? And the answer at the moment is not very well. When we meet difference, we do not see it as a cause for celebration of diversity, but we see it as a cause of threat and danger. And we seek to reach out and destroy that which is different to us. The dance macabre is an artistic genre of late medieval allegory on the universality of death. No matter one station in life, the dance of death unites us all. And such a dance was performed consisting of the dead or personified death, summoning representatives from all walks of life to dance along to the grave, typically with a pope, an emperor, a king, and child and labourer. They were produced such plays and such dances to remind people of the fragility of their lives and how vain were the glories of early life. We find ourselves in a world where we thought through technological advances, dealing with mass hunger, providing for economic growth rather than stagnation, that we would live in a world where we could put off until the end our thoughts of death. And now violence and war is bringing that home to all of us. Dancing at the crossroads picks up a metaphor that is at the heart of Irish culture. The crossroads in Ireland were the place where those living in a timeline gathered to do business and to meet and to celebrate on festivals and social occasions. An Irish president, uh, the first Irish president of the independent state, Eamon de Valera, uh, used the metaphor of maidens dancing at the crossroads as an image of his ideal rural Catholic Ireland, uh, holding back the pressures of modernity and reform. For the people of Northern Ireland in 1968, the crossroads became a haunting metaphor as our then Prime Minister Terence O'Neill broadcast to the nation his famous crossroads speech on the 9th of December. He set out a choice before the whole community, mainly his own people, the unionist community, the people who Ron referred to, of which I was a part, who have been deemed to be the bad guys of history like the Afrikaner in South Africa and the white in the deep south of America. And he called on them to face the crossroads that they now faced, a choice between responding constructively to the civil rights movement, which had legitimate concerns and grievances to address, or allowing their own bigotry and prejudice to determine a political response, which not on its own, because there were other factors of course, the revolutionary Marxist movement of the IRA being the main one, condemned Northern Ireland to a further 40 years of violence and over 3,500 deaths, 50,000 people in prison sentences, and other 40,000 plus with serious injuries from a result of the violence, which among a population of 1.5 million was quite a considerable number of proportion of the population caught up in the consequences of our violence. And we've proved ourselves to be a people in John Hewitt, an Ulster Protestant, in his great poem, An Irishman in Coventry, which obviously I have some affinity to, uh, talks about being a people endlessly betrayed by our own weakness, by the wrongs we suffered in that long twilight over bog and glen, by force, by famine, and by glittering fables which give us martyrs when we needed men by faith which had no charity to offer, by poisoned memory and ready wit, with poverty corroded into malice to hit and run and howl when it is hit. So I come from that sort of crossroads in my own experience in my own community, where the call of the past, the ancestral voices, the wounds of history shaped my generation and condemned us to 40 years of violence and a long, difficult task of making peace. And so I come from the cro to the crossroads of death in our world, to the crossroads where we in Ireland found the place to meet, to converse, to make choices, 
and to eventually transform our conflict and build peace. And I want to reflect with you a little bit on that and on that experience. I don't have a prescription. This is not going to be a model that you can take and tick box. And if we do this, we will ill the world's hatreds and violence. In fact, I'm quite against the technology of peace. One of the things that distresses me in the burgeoning peace industry, and particularly in academic circles, is that once again, the desire to take something which is a relational art, how you live at peace with your neighbour, and to make it into a scientific programme that if only we did this, this and this and released that amount of money and addressed that and the other, then why can't people live at peace with one another? Uh, for the same reason that in rich families you can still be at each other's throats. Because there's things in the narrative, in the story, in the community that lead us to suspicion and hate of each other. And the whole world is a global family. And I constantly confront myself with the question that even with our successful peace process in Northern Ireland, why do people choose to hate? Because they still do. You know, we, we, have, we have a political peace process, but we still do not have reconciliation. We still do not have a healing of our relationships. And why not only do they choose to hate, why do they choose to do so, so completely? Where is this anger coming from? And how can we begin to address that in the art of making peace together? I want to put to you a, a number of metaphors about this crossroads. Crossroads is a place where four roads meet. And there are four roads that I think feed into the conflicts of which we find ourselves apart. And the first road is the political road. The conflicts that we face and the reconciliation that needs to develop in response to them, it's always political. My simple definition of politics is politics is the art of negotiating relationships. So there was a politics of even coming into this room. Who sits where? Who you open the door from? I doubt many of you would have pushed your way past the president. So there's a political relationship negotiated, even in an ad hoc gathering like this. And that's the simple art of sharing space together, of sharing communities together, of sharing churches, of even being in family together. The personal is at the, at, at the heart of how we negotiate our communal space. It is out of the personal we become relational to each other. And right at the core of that is the whole issue of identity and belonging. Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? Who are they? And what is the story that we have shared together in the past? All of us have to have a strong sense of who we are. If we weren't, you wouldn't be sitting here. You'd be locked up in a padded white room somewhere, in a straitjacket. And the same is true of communities. I do like talking more about identity conflicts than about ethnic or tribal or national conflicts. The conflicts of our world are where the holding of identity has gone wrong. And normally because, and particularly out of Northern Ireland, because we hold our identity in such a negative way. Is it, easy, it is easier to say who I am not, I'm not you, than it is to say who I am. And when I define myself as not being you, when I meet you, whether you're Catholic, Irish, Muslim, Egyptian, Syrian, then the you is no longer acceptable to me because I'm not you. And you become a threat. And it's something that I cannot tolerate and find it hard to have a relationship with and to negotiate space with. And so when we meet that difference, rather than the interface, in the words of Miroslav Wolf, becoming a place of embrace, it becomes a place of exclusion. Rather than a place of celebration, it becomes a place where we want to destroy that which is on the other side because it is threatening to us. And all of that negotiation of the personal, of the relational, is a profoundly political act. So all of our conflicts are profoundly political. It is about negotiating relationship between peoples and individuals. And we have a particular problem at the moment. We are in one of those phases of history where the geopolitical balance of power is changing. 
both by demography and population changes and by shift in wealth and coming to an end of a remarkable period of economic growth over the last 70 years and heading into economic stagnation. And therefore, the negotiating of those relationships is profoundly problematic. And the core agreements that were put in place towards the end of the European colonial era, particularly the Sykes-Picot agreement in, in the Levant, agreeing to split up of Iraq, Syria, and uh, Jordan, and Lebanon, and Palestine, and agreements like in Nigeria, which was created as a, a state by the British to make it more economically viable to administer that part of the empire, such agreements are now collapsing. As a resurgence of identity politics, a redefinition of who peoples are, uh, sort of reaches out in anger against the imposed uh, nation state, which has been kept in place primarily through dictatorial regimes that we have given lip service to. So we're actually starting to reap what we sowed in the 1920s. My grandfather was part of the British Army that walked into Mesopotamia in 1921-22 and helped create Iraq. The RAF, the Royal Air Force, shortly after it was founded, were the first people ever to gas the Kurds. We had, were meant to have destroyed some of the gas from the trenches of the First World War. We had kept it. And because our armies couldn't cope with the Kurdish rebellion against this creation of Iraq, the RAF dropped some of this gas on Kurdish villages to put down the rebellion. We were the first to invent concentration camps in the Boer War in South Africa. You know, everything that we hear of, the Western European colonial powers were at the forefront of making happen and leaving a terrible legacy that we're now uh, living with politically. And at this point, I'm starting to blend my four roads and getting ahead of myself. The second road is the ideological one. And the reality is that bad ideology always trumps good. Bad religion always trumps good. It's easier to come along and say to a young Arab in the middle of Syria, with no job, no prospects, no hope, and give him an AK-47 and say, fight with us and we can change the world in five years, than to say, go and say your prayers, read the Quran, get married, bring up your family, and who knows, in 20 years it might be better. That bad ideology is winning. It is winning the hearts and minds of the majority of people in these countries who are now under Billy. And we do not have, as the Archbishop himself said in an article in Prospect magazine before Christmas, we do not have a counter-narrative yet. Because to be honest, earning more money and having a second holiday, one to ski and one to lie in the sun, doesn't really compete with the AK-47 paradise tomorrow. The liberal democratic economic argument no longer works. People are looking for something more fundamental about their land, about who they are, about their religion. And we need to counter that ideological dysfunction and distortion with a, a new narrative of what it means to belong to the human family with our differences, with our different faith commitments, with our different stories and histories. And that brings me to the fourth road, and that is the historical road. History matters. It is our history that has produced the hurt and alienation at the heart of our world. The wounds of history and the ancestral voices. The voices that call us to keep faith with our forebears. There's an Ethiopian proverb, your eyes see the present, but your ears hear the past. And if you think about it, you know, in, in human terms, I can go from 1998, in most family trees in Northern Ireland, to 1798, which was the Great United Irishman Rebellion, and that's 200 years, which seemed an awfully long time, and we think, why bother about that? But those 200 years and what happened in them can be transmitted in some families in five stories, with a great-grandmother, with her great-uncle, with his great-niece. You know, these stories can be transmitted in five human relationships about what happened 200 years ago. And when that happens, temporal time is irrelevant. 
It's what your people did to my great grandfather that matters. And that's intimate and personal. So history also feeds into this deep hurt and alienation. And if you go to the Middle East, if you sit with Palestinians in Ramallah or in Nablus, as I did once, trying to help a, a, an Anglican church there become part of the community of the Cross of Nails at Coventry Cathedral, before I could even begin to talk to the leaders, I had to sit and listen to a two-hour lecture on the Balfour Declaration, the sykes pico Agreement, and everything the British had done in Palestine since 18-something or other to the previous day. That's what it felt like. And I had to listen to that story of hurt and woundedness and alienation before I had the right to be heard and to engage in that conversation. And that leads us to the fourth road that meets at the crossroads, and it is moral. How do we, as individuals and peoples, make choices given this complexity? It has to begin with a hard telling and an honest remembering. There is no point running away from the bad history. We have to confront it. And it is in all sides and every side. Telling one's own story in the presence of one's enemy leads us to one of the greatest acts and journeys of reconciliation. Being able to tell our enemy's story in a way that our enemy recognises it and says, yes, that is my story, is what Stanley Horowitz actually calls reconciliation. And he says, therefore, God is our greatest enemy. Because God comes in the incarnation and tells us the human story as it is. In a way that when we recognise it and say, yes, that is our story, and fall on our knees before his love and grace, that we find ourselves reconciled with God. That is the moral narrative of reconciliation that we find ourselves in. And it seems to me that we need a more nuanced conversation about responsibility for such past, moral responsibility. It is possible for a whole population to be complicit in a discrimination against others, in an imperial exploitation of others, and yet not to be personally culpable for some of the worst acts of violence. And if we sit and say, it wasn't us, we didn't pull the trigger, plant the bomb, put the people on the slave ships, we are not culpable, then we close down the narrative of a space for reconciliation that says, but we are complicit, because we benefited from that. We kept silent. We didn't do what we knew we should have done. And that binary, or that conversation between being complicit and culpable, I think could unlock the key to us engaging with a more moral narrative about the conflicts in our world where there is such hurt and woundedness from the past. All of this requires us to be imaginative. What John Paul Lederach calls the moral imagination of making peace. And it is he more than any other who has helped me to think about peace building not as a science, but as an art. It is something that we create together, that we have imaginative responses to the conflicts of our world. And for John Paul Lederach, the crossroads is not just for these four roads, political, ideological, historical, and moral meet, but the crossroads are where four people embrace. Four people that he imagines out of the story or the narrative of Psalm 85, where truth and peace embrace, where mercy and justice meet one another. And it is where truth and peace and mercy and justice come together that the past can be dealt with, the present can be restored, and the future imagined where we are reconciled together. Truth and peace provide a context where justice and mercy change the conversation. If we are able to tell the truth about each other and to embrace each other in the embrace of peace, to set aside our arms in order to listen to the truth about us that the other has got to tell us, then we might provide the space where justice can be done and mercy can change the conversation. It, for me, it is when these four things come together that reconciliation begins to be witnessed. But at the heart of it, has to be mercy. 
Mercy, the scriptures tell us, triumphs over judgment. On the ruins of the destroyed Coventry Cathedral are the simple words, Father, forgive. Not Father, forgive them, the Luftwaffe and the Germans, but Father, forgive us all for the mess that we are making of the world in which such violence is possible. Two weeks ago, the Archbishop uh, got himself into some trouble with the British press in attending uh, the events in Dresden for the 70th anniversary of the bombing of that city, when in one evening 25,000 people were killed, many of them burned to death. One of the interesting sidelines to mention about that story is that there was a young man called Ray Davy, who was a prisoner of war just outside of Dresden, who was brought in by the Germans the day after to pile up the bodies and to help clear up. And Ray went back to his native Northern Ireland and formed the Cory Wheeler community, who Ron knows, as a peace-building community even before our conflict began in 1968. They were formed by a group of students at Queen's University in the early mid-60s and have been a beacon of reconciliation for Northern Ireland and the world. So out of that destruction came that hope. But the Archbishop got himself into trouble because some in the British press betrayed him of having apologised for bombing the Nazis. He didn't. I should know, I wrote the speech. It was not an apology. <laughs> but what he did say is he stands with the German president and with the people who were in the Frauenkirche that day, over 2,000 people, as a follower of Jesus Christ. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, he had a deep feeling of regret and sorrow for what had happened. The fact that our press reacted to that and doesn't allow that space shows how much of our press and our political narrative is actually not informed by Christian principles. Because it seems to me at the heart of the reconciliation journey is not only forgiveness, but the forgiveness is based on the capacity to empathise with the other. And as he said in the speech, and this is going to be in the tip, but I'm going to say it anyway, the great sacrifice of a speech writer, you give away your best ideas about reconciliation ever to your principal so as he can say them. Uh, so I've been saying this for years, nobody pays any attention, he says it and it gets the headlines. That's good. <laughs> goes with the job. Uh, but the, my one insight that I think I've had about reconciliation, that we know that reconciliation is happening when we have the capacity to memorialise the suffering of our former enemy. It's not about structures and all the things that we look at, when we actually have the human capacity to honour the suffering of the other. That's what the Queen did when she came to Ireland and stood in front of the memorial for the 1916 rebellion in Dublin and listened to commands being given in Irish and bowed her head. These Irish rebels whose successors went on to lead a very brutal war of independence based on assassination and terror. And she stood there and honoured their suffering. It's what unionists have done in Northern Ireland in recognising, some of them anyway, uh, what it cost for the IRA hunger strikers in 1981. That that was an act of bravery. There was suffering for the families. It is what the IRA have done on occasions in acknowledging the hurt and the suffering that they had caused and brought upon their enemy. And it seems to me that that's where we know that reconciliation is beginning to happen. That's when we can demonstrate that mercy is triumphing over judgment, when we're able to genuinely memorialize the suffering of those we once were at enmity with. How do we learn to do this? Where is the dance, a dance of reconciliation? Where do we learn to dance to the one tune? In different keys, maybe, in different harmonies, but the one tune of our common humanity. How do we create this narrative of the future, this dancing at the crossroads, which can be the hope of our world? The first is to recognize that an inclusive society is not necessarily a reconciled one. You can have as many laws of equality and acceptance and inclusion and non-discrimination and civil rights enforcement that you want. But it does not necessarily mean that people are reconciled with one another. Inclusion does not equal reconciliation. Reconciliation requires 
that we seek to build common ground, a sense of belonging together, where we acknowledge the past hurt we've done and we profoundly change our attitude to the other. Where there are no ghettos in our cities, where there isn't instant tension every time a policeman draws his weapon, as you experience here in different neighborhoods. Inclusion does not necessarily mean reconciliation. Neither is a conflict transformed necessarily a relationship restored. When we change our conflicts from violent ones to peaceful political ones, as we have done in Northern Ireland, and have done in many places in the world, if the relationship is going to be restored, we, re we need to renegotiate our identity and our whole place in the world. The British Empire was very good at doing this in a very British sort of way. We still haven't quite got our head around it, so we still have problems with our imperial legacy, particularly in relation to the South Asian subcontinent. We still don't quite know what to make of the fact that the Indians own half of our major industries, cars, steel, and yet, hey, we were the ones who ruled that massive subcontinent. But the British were very clever because they had no choice after World War II but to withdraw from their empire. And so they went about renegotiating their identity, and part of the problems in the Anglican Communion was how the Church of England renegotiated its identity with all these Anglican churches around the world, and what structure it's tried to give to that, which itself is now in trouble. But they renegotiated uh, that relationship, and the Brits did it by sending men in funny feather hats, standing on the quayside, lowering the flag to the last post, having the Royal Marines band walk up and down the quay, get on the ship and sail away back to Blackheath. And we left them all to get on with it. That's how we did it. And it looked wonderful and we were all very polite. And in the background, we were taking all the records of all our special forces and our police forces that kept all these people at bay and kept them, you know, kept a watch on them. And we were burning them and sending them back to London so that they wouldn't get their hands on them about how exploitative our imperial past had actually been. That's all about to be uncovered as 100-year rules kick in and those records start to be revealed in our national archive. But we did it in a rather British restrained sort of way. My fear is that the American empire will be totally the opposite, that you will go out with a tantrum and in so doing bring everybody down with you. Because that's part of your culture. Your culture wars are slightly different to our culture wars. Your temperament of having arguments is very different to ours. You're a society that is more weaponized than ours uh, in ordinary civic interactions. There's all sorts of things that are dangerous signals about how you renegotiate your identity and your place in a world that is changing, where the power is shifting, where it is something that has to be accepted and heard and listened to and where the dance becomes one of reconciliation rather than death and violence. So reconciliation is a process, it's about politics, it's about presence, it's about embracing a different future, but it's always elusive. It is hard to say that we've got there. So it's a constant quest. And it's a dance we have to be taught by God. I don't think you'd be surprised being good Americans, if I didn't finish with simple gifts and Lord of the Dance. And we know that song, that how God came in Christ and danced among us and changed the world. The cross literally became the crossroads where truth and justice and peace and mercy have met and have accomplished reconciliation for the world. And it is that dance that gives us the alternative dance to what our world is wanting to teach us. And it is a dance of faith that the church, wherever it finds itself, needs to rise to. We need to ask ourselves, who is the Lord of our dance? Who is calling our tune? Is it a dance of death? or even simply demonstrates the inevitability of death, like the dance of Macabre, or is it the dance of life? Is it a dance that includes the other or excludes them? Is it about hate or is it about love? 
It's not about technology of building peace or transforming conflict, but by the dance, the moral dance that we weave at the crossroads of our choices as global citizens. And for those of us as Christians who belong to a global church, there is not a people or a nation among which are not to be found the people of God. And if that is not an argument for practical pacifism, I do not know. My journey on that road came during the British Falklands War, where missionary friends of mine who worked in Argentina, their son was conscripted into the Argentinian army to go and fight against the British army in the Falklands because he had an Argentinian passport. And a friend of mine from college was called back into the British Reserve to go and fight in the Falklands against the Argentinian army. Both believers and Christians, both facing the possibility that at some point, across a field, they would be aiming a rifle at each other, seeking to kill each other, members of the body of Christ, never mind of the human race. What tune is the church prepared to dance to? In a world where the moral imagination for peace needs a new tune and some fresh dancers. And that's what I hope to spend most of my life with what God gives me doing, is helping a new generation of fresh dancers. Because without it, without you, there is no hope. There is only the dance of death when we need the dance of life. Thank you.